Hello everyone and welcome to the first day of Earth Science content. Hooray us. So today we're going to start talking about astronomy. Um, and one of the things you're going to learn about me uh, between now and the end of the semester is that if I have to talk about anything, my first impulse um, is to uh, take a historical approach. Uh, this allows me to kind of tell the story in what I feel is a um, is a more interesting way uh, or a more interesting way to present information and so uh, so that's what we're going to do we're going to trace the thread of the Western astronomical tradition we're going to trace the thread of astronomical thought um, among Europeans, North Americans, and uh, South Americans, right? That's what we mean by Western, right? If I was um, doing this lecture in China, we would have a whole different bunch of people. If I was doing this lecture in, you know, Saudi Arabia, uh, in the Middle East, we would have a whole uh, bunch of different people. China is obviously, or maybe not obviously, the Eastern tradition. So, you know, now if we were really going to go back to the beginning, we would need to begin with the ancient Babylonians or the ancient Assyrians or the ancient Egyptians or someone like that. Um, but we're going to kind of skip that mostly because of time. It's fascinating, by the way, if you want to look into that yourself a little bit. Um, you know, Egyptian, Babylonian... Um, uh, Assyrian astronomy is, is really, really quite fascinating. But we're kind of going to jump ahead uh, to the ancient Greeks. You know, Western everything kind of begins with the ancient Greeks. Okay, Western philosophy, government, science, you know, everything kind of began with them in a sort of a, once again, in a Western tradition. Um, the ancient Greeks did a lot of interesting astronomy. They did a lot of good stuff. Um, but they did some kind of not so good stuff too. Um, um, one of the big not great things they did was they had a geocentric view of the universe. So if we think about, you know, this word, and I'll get my laser pointer going here, this word geocentric, the first three letters are geo, right, which means earth, right, geology, right, um, and so, so they put the Earth in the middle, not just of the solar system, but of everything. Okay, and so, um, and then they felt like you know everything went one way or another, and we'll talk more about this around the Earth. Okay, now that's not true, but that's what they thought. Okay, and we can kind of cut them a little bit of slack. I mean, it certainly seems that way, right? But the reason it seems that way is because we're spinning. But if you don't realize that, eh, yeah, that could be a problem. Uh, the, the, the thing here is, and we'll talk more about this in a few minutes, is there was one Greek astronomer, um, Ptolemy, who was so good at this geocentric thing that, you know, scientists even are going to retain a geocentric worldview for a very long time. Um, and, you know, we'll talk more about that, but they are. But, you know, they weren't all bad. They weren't all wrong. They, they got a lot of things right, too, and some of it's quite interesting. For example, they figured out what causes the phases of the moon, right? They figured out, you know, how sometimes you look at the moon and you see this, you see a great big full moon. Other times you look at it, you don't really see it at all, and kind of in between it gets bigger and bigger, or more lit is a better way to say it, and then less lit, and that's a cycle through, through, through the month. In fact, that's where the word month comes from, is it was originally a cycle of the moon's phases, okay? Um, and so, um, and they worked this out. Now, a lot of times people think, oh, well, that's, that's the Earth's shadow, no, 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 that is not the Earth's shadow crossing the moon, okay? That's an eclipse. That's a different thing, okay? Uh, we'll do a whole thing about moon phases, so don't worry too much if right now you're like, ah, you know. But, but what's really causing this is half the moon is always lit by the sun, and then as it goes around the Earth, you can see none and then more and more and more and more of the lit half all of the lit half and then less and less and less of the lit half till you can't see it again um as the moon goes around the earth now 
If you're still kind of lost, it's okay. We're going to do a whole thing about moon phases. I got simulations. I got a lab. I got all kinds of stuff. Okay, so don't don't worry about that. But um, but the, the Greeks worked it out. They figured out, despite having this geocentric worldview, they figured out what causes the phases of the moon. Now, speaking of eclipses, because this isn't one, right? But they did some interesting stuff with the eclipses. Um, they figured out that the Earth is round. I say spherical nature, whatever. The Earth is round, right? They worked that out. Now, maybe you're sitting there and you're going, oh, wait a second, though. Didn't, you know, Christopher Columbus or uh, Cabeza de Vaca or, um, I don't know, Ferdinand Magellan or one of those dudes, you know, show that the Earth was round by sailing around it? Yeah, no. Definitely not Christopher Columbus, right? Let me show you. Christopher Columbus left from Spain. Let me do my little laser pointer thing here. There we go. Left from Spain, landed here in Hispaniola, and thought that he was in India. Christopher Columbus was lost, okay? Looked around, started calling everyone he saw Indians because he thought he was in India, which is why to this day when you say Indian, uh, you have to specify, are you talking about a Native American or are you talking about someone from the subcontinent of India, which is one reason we tend to call these people Native Americans now because we're not continuing that weird legacy of Christopher Columbus not even knowing where he was so anyway uh, th let me let me go back here real quick the first person to circumnavigate the globe was Ferdinand Magellan right or at least Ferdinand Magellan's fleet Ferdinand Magellan died in the Philippines never get off the boat don't get off the boat but his fleet finished the trip okay but that was a feat of seamanship um, no one was really seriously afraid that they were going to fall off of the earth. Okay, that idea was as stupid back then as it is now. Um, the ancient Greeks figured out that the earth was round. Um, and they did it not by sailing around it, but they did it by understanding eclipses. So let me show you how that works. Right? Here is a lunar eclipse. Okay, so what you're seeing here is a full moon with the Earth's shadow crossing it. Well, that shadow is curved, right? If the shadow is curved, the thing making it must be round, okay? And it doesn't matter when the lunar eclipse happens or how the lunar eclipse happens. It, when every single time there's a lunar eclipse, even if it's happening at sunset or sunrise, that shadow is round. That shadow's round, that means the thing casting that shadow must be a sphere. Okay, I cannot believe that I'm having to actually make the case that the Earth is round, but this is where we are, right? If the Earth was flat, if you get a lunar eclipse at sunrise or sunset, which we do all the time, the shadow would just be a line going across the moon, and we have never ever seen that so yeah the earth is around imagine that um so anyway so that but and they figured out what this was and they used that to figure out that the earth was round they could also predict when they were going to happen uh you know they had a pretty good handle on eclipses um but here's the other thing um if you're gonna uh once you figure out that the earth is round the next question is how big is it Right, which is a really fascinating question. Now, I just know that the Earth is 8,000 miles across, which means it's about 24,000 miles around, and I just kind of know that, okay? I've not actually measured it, okay? And if someone said to me, okay, I need you to measure it, I don't know, you know, I'd be like, okay, well, I need a boat and a really long uh, measuring taper, you know, something like that, right? But actually, what I would actually do is what this guy did, Aristosthenes. Aristosthenes was one of the great 
uh, heads or the head of the, one of the heads of the great uh, library at Alexandria, which was one of the, the wonders of the ancient world. Uh, and it was said to house um, a copy of every book in existence at the time. And of course, these were, you know, scrolls back then. Um, it burned to the ground several times. You just can't have that much paper and, you know, candle lighting uh, and not expect bad things to happen. And they did. Um, but this was not, I mean, when you say library and you're talking about ancient Greek, this isn't like the community library where you just go to look at books, right? This, this, was, a, this was a center of learning um, in the ancient world. And uh, Aristosthenes was a great, uh, great scientist. Um, and he is going to use geometry, which as we know, the Greeks loved geometry. He is going to use geometry to figure out how big the earth is and he's going to do it using um an obelisk uh the greeks loved these you know needle shaped monuments that the the ancient egyptians built right and alexandria is in egypt and so you know they brought a lot of these uh to alexandria they just they they loved these things they were they were kind of obsessed with ancient Egyptian spirituality, and so they had these around. Um, um, if you want to see an actual Egyptian obelisk, you don't need to go to Egypt. You can go to Central Park uh, in, obviously, New York City, or you can go to Trafalgar Square in London um, and see actual Egyptian obelisks. Um, so, um, so how is he going to do this? How is he going to use an obelisk um, to figure out how big the earth is. Now, I'm not going to make you do this. I just think it's really cool. And I want to show you what he did. Okay, so here's what he's going to do. You have two locations. Alexandria and Syene. Okay, they're 500 and something miles apart or something like that. And hold on, I'll be right back. I want to check on something. Okay, for some reason I had that slide in there twice and I was wondering what was going on. Um, so, oh, that's why, because I had this little bit here about how far it is. Awesome. Okay, so so we have, so we have um, two locations. We have um, Alexandria and Syene. Okay, they are 517 miles apart. We're going to do this in miles. Uh, Aristosthenes did it in stadia. Uh, which is a Greek unit of measurement. We'll just do it in miles because that's what we know. Um, he doesn't use a post. They call it a post. He used an obelisk. Okay, now here's what he's going to do. He's going to measure the shadow being cast by that obelisk, by the sun's rays, at a time when the sun is directly straight up overhead, 517 miles to the south in Syene, which today is called Answan. Okay, so, oh, my, my, my phone's going off. Um, so anyway, hold on, let me mute that. Alrighty, there we go. Um, so yeah, okay, so, why, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to lower someone down into this well at Syene. It's a dry well. Okay. And the reason we're going to do that is because we want to know when the sun is straight up overhead at Syene. All right. Now, uh, and so if you're down in a, in a cylindrical hole, the only thing you can see is straight up overhead. And so you'll know when the sun is straight up overhead, when you can see the sun, it's straight up overhead. Nowadays, we would use something called a solar sextant. Um, Aristosthenes did not invent the solar sextant, and we can cut him a little bit of slack for that. Okay, so when the sun is straight up overhead at Syene, what you're going to do is you're going to measure the shadow being cast by the sun 517 miles to the northwest um, in Alexandria. Okay, now, um, why are you going to do that? Well, what we want to know is, actually, we want to know this angle. Okay, so let me, let me show you. So, so, um, so here, I photoshopped an obelisk onto the surface of Mars just for fun so we can see what's going on here. Okay, so, um, so the sun's rays come in and they cast a shadow here, right? Because, let me go back here real quick, the earth is round. If the earth was flat, there wouldn't be a shadow here. But anyway, okay. Uh, so, that obelisk is going to cast a shadow, right? So, Aristosthenes is going to measure 
the length of that shadow because here's the trick what he really wants to know is this angle right here okay uh, but once again Greeks geometry right this is a right triangle right um, the, the the obelisk the ground and the ray of sunlight make a right triangle right and so he knows how big the obelisk is because he can just measure that if he can measure that shadow and that's a right angle that means that you know he can calculate uh what that angle is right there uh if you know this side and that side you can calculate that if you know trig you know that 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 that's a tangent function okay uh but you you they you, you can work out what that angle is if you know the two these two the the um what the adjacent and the opposite uh side okay so anyway he can do that so he does the math turns out that angle is seven degrees all right uh and so now let's go back to this okay so that angle is seven degrees well okay so let's think about what we're doing here and once again if you're not really following i don't want you to worry too much about it uh because you're not going to have to do this. I just think it's very cool. Okay. So anyway, so the sun's rays are coming in parallel. Uh, if I extend the line of the obelisk straight down, it goes through the center of the earth. And so what you have is that line crossing two parallel rays, which means that if this angle that we just calculated here is seven degrees, that angle is seven degrees. Well, if I take that angle, that seven degrees, and I divide it by the 360 degree circle, I get 51.4. If I multiply that 51.4, there we go, by the distance between Alexandria and Syene, that's how big the Earth is. And you get 26,573, which is a little big, right? It's a, it's a wee bit off, okay? But it's not bad right? i mean it's not bad at all you know because th i mean there's a lot i mean there, there's a lot of assumptions here right you're assuming that 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 obelisk is bang on uh straight up and down and the line would cross the center of the earth and it's probably not it's probably wonky a little bit okay um you know you're measuring a shadow which is not easy but but the basic technique is good right the the basic technique is is pretty dang good and he got he got a number that was really really in the ballpark the real number is closer to 24 he's in the ballpark okay incidentally i'm drinking some water hold on y'all incidentally christopher columbus did not believe aristosthenes number which is how he was a he thought the earth was a lot smaller um which is how he was able to sail um from spain to uh hispaniola and think he had gone all the way to india okay so yeah i'm um, sorry i just i like making fun of christopher columbus because i just do um anyway okay so let's let's return though to this uh this ptolemaic or this this geocentric system okay there was another greek astronomer named ptolemy uh another head of the great um library at alexandria um who really really refined um this um this uh geocentric view to the point where it actually worked well enough that it is going to persist you know well into the 1500s uh so that's you know a couple thousand years of of um you know of geocentrism okay but it's a little more complicated than you would think it is right um so what ptolemy does is he puts the earth in the middle not right but that's his system he puts the moon in orbit around the earth which works because the moon does orbit the earth okay uh he puts the sun in its orbit around the earth which also works but it's not true right it looks like the sun's going around the earth because the earth is spinning okay but okay right uh hold on my battery's running low my computer's not plugged in let me fix that i will be right back
Okay, the sun doesn't actually go around the earth, obviously, okay, but it seems that way because the earth is spinning, right? Where things get weird and complicated is when we start looking at the planets, right? Because it's not as simple as the planets just go around the earth, right? You can see here that, um, that you know, as Mars, for example, uh, according to Ptolemy, goes around the earth it does so on this smaller little loop uh called an epicycle okay um and so as mars goes around the earth it does this it loops around like this right and so uh that seems weird and you can see that all of the planets are on these little epicycles now uh mercury venus mars jupiter and saturn right they don't know about Uranus, Neptune, or Pluto, or any of the other dwarf planets, because you can't see those with the naked eye, right? The only planets the ancient Greeks knew about were the ones you can see with the naked eye. So, so yeah, so it's a geocentric system with the planets on these loopy little epicycles, okay? Now, why would they need that, right? Because, look, everything in a 24-hour period will rise in the east and set in the west right it just does okay um that's because the earth is spinning right so you would think it would be simple just just the planets don't they just seem to go around the earth why do we have them on these goofy little little epicycles okay well uh here's the thing so here's the night sky Okay, now, let's say that we're going to go out, and I'm drawing with my mouse, y'all, so bear with me. So let's say we're going to go out uh, at midnight, and we're going to look for Mars. So where's Mars? Okay, so let's say, let's say we look, and Mars is there. Great, let's go to bed. You come out the next night, and at the same time, so let's say midnight, you come out the next night, and Mars is there. It's moved a little bit. Okay, next night. Mars is there okay it's moved a little bit and so as you as you watch Mars every night it will gradually move across the sky okay now the trick here is every now and then and in the case of Mars for about 88 days it does this it'll curve around for about 88 days and then it'll do this again and then you know it comes over here and it'll do it again. I don't know if I got the geometry exactly right, but you get the idea, right? And so that's what Mars looks like as it moves through the night sky. Okay, now, incidentally, the motion of Mars and all of the planets, right, through the night sky like this is the only thing that distinguishes them from a star, right? For the ancient Greeks didn't have a telescope, right? planets were just stars that moved differently right that's it that's it right until galileo points a telescope at a planet okay uh the only difference and the greeks couldn't have pointed a telescope at a planet because they didn't have telescopes is this motion right the word planet actually comes from the greek word planete which means wanderer okay and so so planets would move across the sky and then every now and then they would go backward for a little bit we call that backward period i'm writing with my mouse so bear with me we call that backward motion retrograde motion and it happens it's an observation people who are into astrology with an l okay um oh mars is in retrograde everything's going to be weird or venus is retrograde everyone look out or you know whatever um but it happens it does happen and so so ptolemy knew about this and he needed to explain it all right so what does he do well let me go back to this slide. He puts the planets on these little epicycles, right? Because if you do that, now watch what happens. Now, as Mars goes around the Earth and goes around this little suborbit, right? What's going to happen is it's going to loop around there. It's going backward, right? There, it's going backward. There, it's going backward, right? So if you're looking at it from the Earth, it's going to look like that, 
right and so yeah and so so in here right this is where this part of the cycle right here is where you get that retrograde motion right so ptolemy needed these epicycles to explain the observation of retrograde motion okay and the way he got that was by putting like i said putting the plants on these little epicycles so that as they go around the earth they loop around like this and for a time they will seem to be going quote unquote backward okay so ptolemy needed these epicycles to explain this retrograde motion that we saw in the night sky okay and he did it he he worked it out he worked it out well I mean, he put, I mean, he put epicycles inside of epicycles, and he really got it to work very, very well. He wrote a book called The Amalgamized, uh, where he was able to predict planetary positions out for literally thousands of years, um, because he was just so very good at this. Um, some people feel like Ptolemy might have been smart enough to know. Hmm. To know better <laughs> uh, but he was also smart enough to keep his mouth shut uh, I have no I don't know I mean I don't think you needed to be smart to kind of you know um, to, to, to know better necessarily um, I think you could be very smart and, and just you know be stuck in this worldview um, and so and so anyway so so this he did but he did such a good job with this that this system is going to persist for a very long time time now i don't want to leave off of the ancient greeks without mentioning another guy um eh, sorry I, I i just saw this guy's name i thought it was pronounced differently and now i'm like looking at it and i'm like nope that's not the way that's pronounced aristarchus aristarchus of samos he was a heliocentrist he put the sun in the middle and the planets in their orbits around the sun, which is the way it actually is. Um, the problem is, at the time, he was disagreeing with both Ptolemy and Aristotle. And at that point, even if you're right, no one's going to believe you. You're just not going to get any traction. And so, so, um, so I mean, he's out there, but, um, but no, right? But keep him in mind, because, you know, we're, we're about to talk about Copernicus, and people like to go, oh, Copernicus was the first person to... No, Copernicus was not the first person. Uh, uh, he, he's the most famous and we'll mention him but he's not the first person um and, and, and along those lines too let's also keep in mind that let's not let's not make the mistake of thinking that the first white european dude to do something was the first person to do it okay in fact you know he almost certainly wasn't okay um i'm about to launch into what i call the parade of dead white men okay uh people whose names you've heard um isaac newton and you know copernicus and some you haven't heard like tycho Brahe and kepler um you know these are the names that are constantly coming up in our western uh tradition but you know once again the western tradition is by no means the only tradition there's an eastern tradition there's a middle eastern tradition that we'll talk a little bit about um but also also, I mean, lots of other cultures have done astronomy. Uh, it's you know, it's really one of the oldest sciences, right? Because you know, you use it to navigate, you use it to make calendars. Um, you know, it has some very, very practical applications, and so. You know, pretty much right after medicine, astronomy is what most cultures do. Okay, um, for example, um, the ancient Mayans were great astronomers. Uh, this is an astronomical observatory in the, the, the ancient Mayan city of Chichen Itza. Um, and it has doors and windows that are very precisely aligned uh, with the position of the sun at the equinoxes and the solstices and points of orbit uh, around the sun. They had a very sophisticated understanding of, of astronomy. Um, I mentioned calendars. One way to tell whether or not your uh, culture or a culture um, understands astronomy is how good is their calendar um, uh, um, this is not a Mayan calendar by the way this is an Aztec calendar but the Mayan calendar was similar um, 
and it's very very good the problem with calendar making and I'm gonna try hard not to go down this particular rabbit hole uh, with you guys um, the problem with calendar making is nothing divides evenly all right when I when you ask okay how many days in a year 365 no it's not 365 it's 365 point two five that's why we have leap year every year we add a day to our calendar if we didn't do that our calendar would get out of sync with the seasons and eventually you would be having you know summer in january okay so if you don't know about that point two five your calendar is never going to work okay the next um thing people do is they start dividing up the year uh, into months according to the phases of the moon right and so we ask how many months in a year and we say 12 but it's not 12 it's 12 it's 11 point something if you go by just the phases of the moon nothing divides evenly and so when you really do sit down to try to use these astronomical phenomenon to um to make a calendar you immediately run into problems um there are a number of ways to deal with them some cultures um just make what's called a lunar calendar um the muslim um holy calendar is a lunar calendar they just have 12 cycles of the moon's phases per year it's out of sync with the seasons they don't care that's not what that calendar is for, which is why, um, you know, those Muslim holidays, uh, Ramadan and Eid and whatnot, drift with respect to our Gregorian calendar. They're not always on the same day. Uh, the ancient Jewish calendar is also a lunar calendar. There are a number of ways to deal with this. And by the way, some of that lunar calendar um, has snuck into the Gregorian calendar and Christian holidays. Um, ask yourself, when is, when is Christmas? Well, it's December the 25th. Okay, we get that. Great. When's Easter? Right? Doesn't have a date. Right? Easter is the first Sunday after the first new moon after the spring equinox. Unless that puts it on the same Sunday as Passover, then it's the next Sunday. Okay? Bits of that lunar calendar have snuck their way into our uh, reckoning of Christian holidays and there have been movements to try to set the date of Easter and they ne they never go anywhere but anyway so but 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 my point is you know lots of people understood and understand astronomy not just the European dudes um, ancient Egyptians had two calendars they had a civil calendar I I'm a little bit obsessed with calendars, y'all. Sorry. Uh, they had they had two calendars. They had a civil calendar for um, for business transactions, and they had a um, a religious calendar. Right. Those pyramids in Giza are oriented bang on north, south, east, west, which is really interesting. Um, uh, because here's the trick: when they were built four thousand years ago, there was no north star. We'll talk about why, but there wasn't, okay? Um, and so, you know, getting those things oriented that, that precisely is, is a really interesting thing. Um, and so, you know, and there's lots of geometry here uh, that shows us that they understood uh, um, astronomy. We read Egyptian hieroglyphics because we have this, the Rosetta Stone which was found by some of Napoleon's guys. Um, it's, 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 it's a document from a temple. It's a fairly routine document, actually chiseled into stone in Egyptian hieroglyphic. Um, ancient Greek, I think, or something like that. And ancient Babylonian, I don't know. But if you have the same thing written in three languages and you speak one of them, you can use it to translate the other two. And that was the case with the Rosetta Stone. But let's also, let's let's not neglect sub-Saharan African cultures, you know, cultures that don't have a written tradition. It doesn't mean they don't know stuff, it just means they didn't write it down, right? And so, you know, sub-Saharan African cultures, Native American cultures, first people in Canada cultures, um, uh, Aboriginal Australian cultures. I mean, I can go on and on and on. There's all kinds of people out there who no doubt have worked this stuff out. Okay. Uh, we are following the Western thread, which there's nothing wrong with that. But, you know, but once again, don't make the mistake of thinking that the first European guy to figure something out is the first person who ever figured it out. They are most likely not. Okay. These are just the names that we know. Okay. Now, okay. We need a bridge. 
we need a bridge from the ancient Greeks to the Renaissance in Europe because Europe is about to go into uh, the Dark Ages, uh, medieval times, I mean, call it what you want. It's not that there was no science. There was science. There were plenty of people doing science. Let's not get that odd, okay? But science was, let's say, not as important. Okay, and so um, and so we need you know where is this knowledge really going to live and be developed during what while well, Europe is you know running around knocking each other off of horses with sticks and stuff. Okay, not that was probably not fair, but there it is. Okay, so uh, here here's here's who's next. Our Islamic astronomers. Um, there is a huge, massive, rich tradition of astronomy um, within Muslim culture. Um, this is one caliphate, the Abbasid Caliphate, that existed from 750 to 1258. And you can see that it's a lot of what used to be the Roman Empire. Uh, and then plus the Middle East. And so, and like I said... Um, Islamic astronomy is really, really a thing. They have a rich uh, tradition of astronomy. Uh, they use a lunar calendar, and there's a lot of things there that need to be observed and calculated and done. And then a lot of, you know, a lot of this is driven by their faith, but it's still, you know, it's uh, well, heck, a lot of the European stuff is driven by faith too. By the way, back now, back then, so um. We'll talk a little bit about that. And so they, they did a lot of really good, really um, amazing astronomy. Um, one guy in particular I want to talk about is this guy, Ibn al-Shatir. Uh, Ibn al-Shatir was a, an incredible astronomer. And our first European guy, Nicholas Copernicus, a lot of his math looks suspicious suspiciously similar to Ibn al-Shatir's. No one's really sure how Copernicus knew about Ibn al-Shatir, but he did. <laughs> and, uh, you know, when you look at, at Copernicus's math, it's like, oh, really? I don't think you came up with that all by yourself. <laughs> and so, yeah, uh, so it's, uh, it's kind of fun. But anyway, okay, so our first European dude, um, is Nicholas Copernicus, who lived in the late 14 to early 1500s in Poland. Uh, he was a monk, by the way. Um, uh, you know, all of these uh, men, and unfortunately they are all men, um, who, we, uh, who we're going to talk about, were all men of tremendous faith. Uh, and, and Nicholas Copernicus was no exception, right? Here's a, here's a picture done in uh, 1872 by Jan Machenko called, you know, Conversation with God, okay? Uh, and, you know, and there was not nearly uh, the division between science and faith back then that there is now. Uh, and in fact, um, these, these astronomers all felt as if, um, you know, by studying astronomy, they were literally looking into the mind of God. And in the case of Copernicus, it's gonna, that's gonna leave a little bit of straight. Hold on, I need more water. In the case of Copernicus, um, that's gonna lead him a little bit astray. Um, it is, and we'll talk about that here in just a second. What Copernicus is known for is what you see right here, which I will show you here. Is he? He was not the first. We didn't, but but you know, but he's the guy we know um, who was, let's say, one of the first uh, to propose and really develop a heliocentric view of the solar system. Right now, Helios is the Greek god of the sun. And so, whenever you see that prefix helio, think sun. You're usually talking about the sun. So, heliocentric is a sun-centered view. And if we look, we can see that. There's the sun, and there's Mercury, Venus, Earth, our moon, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. Once again, we haven't discovered Uranus or Neptune or Pluto. Uh, and so um, those aren't on here, right? It's going to be a while before we discover those planets, okay? So, so once again, these are just the ones that are visible to the naked eye, okay? Now, here's the thing, though. So Copernicus put the sun in the middle, but 
he felt like the orbits of the planets around the sun were perfect circles okay and he felt this way because he felt like by studying astronomy he was looking into the mind of god all right um and so he felt like everything he saw needed to be perfect all right and so uh and he felt like a circle was the most perfect shape and therefore you know they're circles okay the problem is they're not circles they're ellipses they're kind of little flattened circles and and the reason this is a problem is because Coper this means that copernicus's predictions about where the planets are going to be were always a little bit off because he had the orbital shapes wrong so meanwhile though right ptolemy with his geocentric system his predictions were bang on absolutely dead on and so you know there's this idea out there that after you know copernicus everyone at least all the scientists went oh right of course he's right what what what, what were we there? it really wasn't like that right because if you're a scientist and now so now you've got copernicus with his model out there and you got ptolemy with his model out there and ptolemy's predictions are better Right, I mean, it's it's a perfectly rational thing to go with the guy whose predictions are better, even though the model is really starting to look silly. Right, by now we're beginning to get the idea that things don't just go looping around in space. But nevertheless, his predictions were dead on. Okay, so 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 this system is going to be out there, and also though this doesn't banish Ptolemy. Right, it's going to be a little while before we do that. Okay, um, there's going to be a lot of controversy, even in scientific circles, um, about who is right here. Um, it's not really clear how Copernicus got away with this, by the way. Uh, there were Italian astronomers who were burned at the stake for suggesting this. Okay, once again, he was not the first. Okay, um, so yeah, how did he get away with this? Okay, a couple things. First thing, few things. First thing. He wasn't in Italy. He was in Poland, right? Not right under the Pope's nose. So, you know, he probably had a cardinal or a bishop above him who could, you know, give him, cut him a little bit of slack. He was a monk, which helped, okay? But, uh, okay, another thing. His book was published on the day he died. So, you know, what are you going to do? Okay, uh, the other thing, though. And because because here's the thing, you know, even though his book was published the day he died, it wasn't like no one knew what he thought. I mean, he had been talking about this for a while. So here's the thing, though. Copernicus hedged his bets. Copernicus said, "Look, I'm not saying the sun is actually in the middle. Okay, I'm saying that if you want to model the solar system." It's better if you put the sun in the middle because you get rid of all those epicycles and it's easier to model it that way. Because because Ptolemy's system was really quite complicated. Okay, I mean I, I gave you the simple version of it. It's really quite complicated. Copernicus is like, look, if you put the sun in the middle, yeah, okay, uh, you know, uh, you don't need those epicycles, right? And so now you're going, okay, but how are you going to explain that retrograde motion with the sun in the middle? Which was something I actually meant to talk about before, but forgot. So let's let's talk about that. Okay, so, oh, hold on, uh, yeah, you can discard my ink. Okay, so let me show you something. So you don't need to see my files. Um, you do want to see this, though. Okay, so, um, so here um, is a model of the solar system with the sun in the middle. Okay, uh, and so here's the Earth, here's Mars, right? And then here is where we see Mars um, in the night sky. Okay, now, so this is the way it actually is. So how do we get Mars to look like it's going backward in the night sky okay well let's look let's start this so we're going to start this and i want so they've drawn a line here projecting mars into the stars and so um and so let's take a look at what happens so oops um, uh, there we go okay uh, okay fine 
Don't, oh, let me take my hand off of this. Sorry. Okay. No, that's not working either. Fine. Here we go. We're going to start it. We're going to start. There we go. No. Fine. I'll do the slider. Okay. As we pass Mars, as we go around the sun, that's when it looks like it's moving backward. Then it moves forward again right and so uh and so let me go back and i'll do it again right and so um normally i can just run this but apparently it's being weird that's fine right and so so what makes mars look like it's moving backward is right here we're passing it right it's a, it's like when you pass someone in your car you they're moving 60 miles an hour but if you're moving 65 right when you go by them it looks like it's moving backward right and Aristarchus realized this and Copernicus realized this and anyone who was a heliocentrist understood that you can get that retrograde motion without epicycles right and so yeah and so um and let me go back to my powerpoint there we go and let me make it so y'all can stop seeing that and there we go and one more button to push there right and so um and so yeah so he can you you can get retrograde motion without epicycles just by the um the uh the earth passing planets as we go around the sun or the other thing is for the two planets that are closer to the sun than we are that would be mercury and venus right what you're seeing with them is them going around the sun Right, and so they're going to go one way, then another way, then one way, then another way, and one way, and another way from our point of view. So the actual cause of that retrograde motion is either us passing a planet as we go around the sun, okay, or the planet going around the sun, right, seeming to go back and forth in the night sky from our point of view as it goes around the sun but once again um copernicus didn't actually suggest the sun was in the middle he said look we can model it this way and it gets a lot simpler now ironically enough his model wasn't that great because his orbital shapes were wrong okay um and so yeah so i've got words to that effect right there um, if you're writing things down, pause the video, uh, or if you have the notes, they're already in the notes. Okay, so, here is a very accurate picture of the Earth's orbit around the sun. And it is an ellipse, not a circle, okay? And, you know, that's, that's really kind of, I mean... <laughs> okay if you say so i got this picture from from our astronomy professor dr joseph and so you know but if you look at it you know this i mean can i can i change the color mm -hmm. oh i can't let's 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 make it yellow right if you look at it you know the sun sh you know is, is is there it should maybe be here right it's you know it's it, that that seems to me to be closer to the to the center of that circle the sun looks like it's offset this way and i'm drawing with my mouse so bear with me all suddenly you know, it looks like it's offset that way a little bit right not a lot not a whole lot at all a little bit but but it is it is definitely subtle okay uh but but nevertheless it is there this is an ellipse not a circle okay now working that out is going to be tricky it's going to be very tricky and it's going to take two things really okay um it's going to take a pile of data we're going to need a lot of really very good data okay and we're going to need someone to analyze those data all right um now those two things rarely happen in the same person right usually the person who's collecting the data is not nearly as good at analyzing it as someone else is right that's kind of two different skill sets all right uh and so who's going to collect the data because we need we need we need very accurate data. we don't need to know mars is you know in capricorn we need to know exactly where mars 
is. Okay, so how are we going to do this? Well, okay. The data are going to come from this guy, Tycho Brahe. Late 15, early 1600s. Okay, Tycho Brahe was royal. I think I want to say he was Dutch, but I'm not entirely sure about that. But anyway, he was royal. He was related to the king. He was quite the character um, uh, and a great astronomer, along, by the way, with his sister, um, Sophia Bray. Uh, there are a few um, brother-sister teams in astronomy, by the way, back then. Um, you know, women basically just weren't allowed to do this kind of thing. And so they kind of hopped on with their brothers and did a lot of really good work. Tycho Brahe's sister, Sophia, was also a great astronomer. Another one, we'll talk briefly about William Herschel later on. Um, um, his sister, Caroline Herschel, was also a great astronomer. Um, you know, the, 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 the bad thing was, you know, um, smart women were frequently accused of being witches, which is a whole thing. <laughs> um, um, and so you had to be, you know, they had to be really, really careful. And so, um, so they could kind of insulate themselves from that to some degree by, you know, doing this kind of work with their brothers. Um, Galileo had daughters who were very, very smart. I um, mean, they were nuns. Uh, which was another thing that very smart women did back then because it was safe. Um, and so, yeah, Tycho, I need to get a picture of Sophia, but Tycho and Sophia Bray, great astronomers. See how it looks like Tycho's wearing a, a breathe right strip over the bridge of his nose here? He lost the bridge of his nose in a sword fight over astronomy. Um, he was drinking in the astronomer's bar one night and had a disagreement with a guy. And um, they took it out back and the guy pulled a sword and lopped off the bridge of his nose. And so he, uh, he made, a, made a replacement nose out of like gold and silver and precious metals. And he had to like hold it in place with nose goop. And I'm pretty sure it fell off of his face every now and then. And you know, he probably didn't like that very much. It's just, it's just really fun to make fun of Tycho Brahe. I'm sorry. But anyway, um, he is a great astronomer. He, he really was. Uh, he, he truly was. And what we know Tycho Brahe for is amassing a great deal of very precise measurements. He, um, he was very, very good at measuring things and building instruments. He built, um, he built uh, um, astronomical observatories all over Europe. Now, not telescopes, but buildings with, once again, very precisely aligned windows and doors. And he built instruments to measure things. And he amassed a tremendous data set best data set in Europe, probably the best data set in the world. I just don't know that much about Eastern or Middle Eastern astronomy to really know, but, but definitely Europe. <laughs> okay. Um, now, interestingly though, Tycho Bray had a geocentric point of view. Um, he, he, um, he felt like uh, the Earth was stationary um, in the middle of the solar system, but he had an actual interesting idea about why. And his idea about why has to do with the lack of parallax. Okay, now what is parallax? Well, parallax, and I have a definition here, but it's not that great. Parallax is when distant objects seem to be moving, okay? Not because they're moving, but because you're moving, right? And let me try to draw this. Normally, I stand up in front of the class and I walk around. Um, obviously, I can't do that, but let me see if I can draw this. And let me switch my color. Um, let me switch my color back to red because I think that works a little bit better. So let's say that there's three of us in a room and one person is sitting here and another person is sitting here. And now I'm going to walk. Right, I'm gonna walk from here over to here. Okay, so I'm just I'm gonna walk. All right, now um, as I look at you, when I'm standing here and I'm looking, this person here is to the right. Of, right, if, if my line of sight, let me use a different color. If my line of sight is is like this, right? If that's my line of sight. This person here is to the right of this person here, right? As I'm walking here, you're lined up perfectly. Once I get over here, now my line of sight is like this, 
right looking just in between you now from my point of view this person here is sitting to the left of that person there right and so you know from my point of view as I walk from here to here your positions shifted that's parallax that's all it is right and and you know it's so common that your brain cancels it out right you know it's not like every time you move you know you're like whoa 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 am, am i moving or is that moving no you, you you know who's moving okay it's, it's it's not that big a deal and it's a fancy word for something that's very simple parallax okay is when objects seem to be moving not because they're moving but because you're moving so what does this have to do with astronomy well Tycho bray said okay look um he's let me let me let me uh let me let me erase this. Let me keep my two my two things here. But Tycho Brace, okay, look, um, if the Earth is going around the sun, then when I look at the stars, I should see parallax, right? And so what Tycho Brace is saying is, look, if this is the sun here, I'm drawing with my mouse, so bear with me. If this isn't really, seriously, y'all bear with me. If that's the sun there, okay, and let's get some blue going, right? And this is the earth here. Let me do it right about there, okay? So there's the earth. If we can see that well enough, we can, okay? And so he said, look, if the earth is going around the sun, this is looking lame, but you get the idea. If the Earth is going around the sun, then when I look at the stars, let me go back to my my uh, my yellow color, right? When I look at the stars, I should see parallax, right? When I'm over here, this star, now they're stars, not people. This star is to the left of the star over here. When the Earth is over here, they have shifted now. And this star is to the right okay so so he's saying that look if the earth is moving around the Sun then the positions of the stars relative to each other should shift and he said and they don't right when you look at the night sky the stars are always 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 in the same place they don't move, right? The Big Dipper always looks like the Big Dipper. It doesn't change, right? The stars do not, you know, rearrange themselves in the night sky, right? As, you know, as we go around the sun. The man has a point, right? He is right as far as he goes, yes. When you look at the stars, you do not see their position shift you know throughout the year you know as we go around the sun okay so where did Tycho Brahe go wrong well here's the thing stellar parallax does exist okay you just can't see it using something that looks like furniture Okay, you need something that looks like the Hubble, not actually the Hubble, but something like it. Okay, I mean you need you need a very very powerful, very very sophisticated instrument. Okay, this this drawing that I just did here has a massive scale issue, right? These stars are way too clever. Right? This is in, if if this is my scale, you know that's not a star right about there. That's Mars. Okay, right? No, right? They are way, way further away than that. Okay? If, and, and the way I normally do this is I stand in front of the class and I stand about three feet away from a chair and I say, I'm the earth and you guys are the stars, right? And I walk around the chair and your position shift, right? Okay, now, so that's the scale I kind of know, okay? If we're going to do that physical model and you guys are actually going to be the stars, the closest of you is sitting across the Atlantic Ocean and halfway across the Sahara Desert. That's the closest star. That's Proxima Centauri. Okay, so now let me walk around in my little three foot radius orbit and see if I can see your positions moving relative to each other. And I can't, right? The parallax shift now is so tiny that I can't see it. It's there, but it's tiny. 
okay that's where Tycho Brahe went wrong was he's right he's right about this okay as the sun goes the earth see, I, I just switched to geocentrism as the earth goes around the sun okay yeah you know you should see parallax okay and you do it's just very very small and very very difficult to measure okay nevertheless Tycho Brain had a really interesting argument, you know, and so so here's the thing. This is called the Taconic system, and it is a hot mess because he puts the Earth in the middle, he puts the moon going around the Earth, he puts the sun going around the Earth. It seems that way because it spins. But here's the thing. By now, it's getting obvious that the other planets go around the sun. Look, Mercury has an orbital period of 88 days, okay? Um, if you watch Mercury for three months, you're going to see it go around the sun, okay? Venus has an orbital period of 244 days, okay? You watch Venus for, you know, a year, you're going to see it go around the sun. Mars is a year and a half. You get the idea. Right? I mean, you watch these planets for long enough, and you will see them just go around the sun. Right? And so, Tycho, and Tycho Brahe, I mean, he knew this, right? He was not stupid. <laughs> um, and so what he did was he put the sun in motion around the earth, but then the planets go in motion around the sun as the sun goes around the earth. Good luck getting that to ever work. And by work, I mean match reality, right? Match what you see in the night sky. It's never going to happen. Okay? It's, it's, just, it's just not, okay? But that was his system, and he was forced into it because he didn't think the Earth was moving. Because there was no parallax among the stars. So, um, okay, so this is not going to work. But meanwhile, Tycho Bray has piles of data just piles and piles of data and um um but once again Tycho Bray is that guy you want running your lab collecting your data he is not the guy you want analyzing your data and especially not in the days when you know you analyze data with a goose quill pen and a piece of parchment paper right I mean he's not that guy um, that guy is Johannes Kepler. Um, Kepler was Isaac Newton before Isaac Newton. Kepler was Isaac Newton 200 years before Isaac Newton. Okay, I mean, he was really was brilliant. You probably never heard of him. Uh, in my opinion, he does not get nearly the credit he deserves. Um, a lot of um, commentaries on him uh, describe him as Tycho Bray's assistant. He was not Tycho Bray's assistant. Um, they did not get along well enough for Kepler. To, they hated each other, okay? But they needed each other. Kepler knew how to do the math. Tycho Bray had the data. All right, Tycho Bray can't do anything with this data without the math, and Kepler can't do his math without the data. So they had this really horrible codependent relationship where they needed each other, but they could not stand each other. And so, yeah. So Kepler will be our next guy, but that is the end of this lecture. Uh, it's about an hour long, which is about what I wanted to do. So I believe we are good to go. So tune in next time, and we will talk about Johannes Kepler and what he does with Tycho Bray's data, which is going to be to formulate three laws of planetary motion um, that Isaac Newton is going to come along and go, oh, look at that. Maybe I can turn those into laws of of motion okay not planetary motion but just motion in general which of course isaac newton is famous for so so tune in next time for johannes kepler uh galileo isaac newton and we'll move on and talk about some of the motions that the, the planets go through uh in the, the planets and well all sorts of astronomical bodies the moon the planets all kinds of things go through um 
uh, uh, as they uh, move through the night sky. Okay, I'm done talking. I should have stopped talking a few minutes ago. Alrighty, y'all. Take care, uh, and I'll see you later. Bye-bye.